This is our sixth video lecture on Lesson 6 from Clayton Croy's A Primer to Biblical Greek. In this lesson, we will cover exceptions to first and second declension nouns and prepositions. Remember that in Greek, there are patterns or declensions for forming Greek nouns. And so far, we have learned two of those. We learned about first declension nouns that end in eta or alpha, and they are mostly feminine in gender. We also learned about second declension nouns that end in os or on, and these are mostly masculine or neuter in, it, uh, in gender. And so now we are entering the exception zone. We're going to be looking at feminine nouns that follow the pattern of second declension nouns. So for example, the Greek word eremos, which means desert. Now, if you just saw eremos, you would think that this is a second declension noun and that the os ending would suggest that it's masculine. But in fact, it takes a feminine definite article, which is always provided in the vocabulary list. So it's very important that when you're memorizing vocabulary that you also memorize the definite article that goes along with it. It will help you tremendously as we move forward in the class. So here is a paradigm of he eremas uh, with those definite articles. So he eremas, tes eremu, te eremo, ten eremon, ereme, hai eremoi, ton eremon, tais eremois, tas eremus, eremoi. So you can see that the, the definite article is consistently feminine throughout, even though the endings for eremas seem to be of that second declension. And so feminine nouns that are formed after the second declension will continue to to take feminine articles, adjectives, and other modifiers. So there are also masculine nouns that mostly follow the pattern of first declension nouns. So for example, mathetes. In addition to feminine nouns that follow the second declension pattern, we also have masculine nouns that follow, for the most part, the first declension nouns. And so an example of this is the Greek word mathetes, which means disciple. This word would take the masculine definite article ha, and it would agree with articles, adjectives, and other modifiers in gender. So remember, first declension nouns have these endings, a or a, os or ace, a or a, on or ain, a or a, i, on, ice, os, i. And so when we look at a, at a Greek word that is one of these exceptions to the rule, like ha prophetes, we can see that for the most part, uh, it follows the pattern of that first declension. The exceptions are noted in green. So prophetes, prophetu, prophete, prophetain, propheta, prophetai, propheton, prophetais, prophetas, prophetai. You can see that the plural is completely consistent with that first declension pattern and that the dative and accusative singular are also. And so the real exceptions then are prophetes, prophetu, and propheta, the nominative singular, the nominative genitive, and the nominative vocative. So remember that for the most part, this follows the form of the pure eta of the first declension, a word like phone, and the only exception is in the nominative, genitive, and vocative singular. So how do we deal with these exceptions? Hopefully we don't freak out. First, you want to know the regular endings. That will at least give you case and number. So if you're familiar with those standard endings um, of the first and second declension nouns, you'll, you'll be able to figure out case and number. And then you also want to memorize the definite articles along with vocabulary words. This will help you remember that that prophetes is a masculine noun, even though it, it's going to follow some characteristics of feminine nouns. And then finally, you're going to use the context, articles, adjectives, and other words in a sentence to help you figure out the gender and the case and the number of Greek words. All right, so let's talk about prepositions. Basically, in English, um, prepositions express a relationship between a noun or pronoun and some other part of the sentence. And that's true of Greek prepositions as well. Here is an image of some of the Greek prepositions that show how they often denote spatial qualities. You have huper, which means above. You have epi, which means upon. 
You have pros, which means to or toward, and you see the arrow moving towards that circle. You have en, which is to means in, so it's in the circle. You have apo, which is to, is moving away from. You have dia there, which is moving through. Uh, the preposition dia means through. You have ace, which means into, and you have ek, which means out of. And then you have peri, uh, which means, at least in the when it is followed by the accusative case, means around. And then hupo in the accusative, with the accusative case, means under. And then finally, para with the accusative means by or along. And so this is sort of a big picture of how prepositions work in Greek. All right, a few more details about preposition. First, the object of the preposition, that is the noun or pronoun modified by it, will be in either the genitive, dative, or accusative cases. And so memorizing a preposition along with the case or cases that it takes is really important because several prepositions will have different meanings depending on the case of the object of their preposition. So it's really important, I'll just say this probably for the third or fourth time, memorize the preposition and the case. Or if you prefer, you might memorize a preposition with a short Greek phrase after it that would help you remember what that case means um, for the preposition. And finally, prepositional phrases can function like attributive adjectives. And here we are getting into some of the fluidity and flexibility of the Greek language that makes it so fun to work with, but also can be very challenging at first. So remember that attributive adjectives are, are something like the English, the good act. And we talked about how in Greek, there are two ways of forming the, the attributive adjective. You can either put the adjective in between a noun and its article, so ta kalon ergon, the good or beautiful work, or the adjective can follow a noun and have its own article, so ta ergon, ta kalon, which again means the, uh, the beautiful or good work. The translation is identical, it's just the form that is a slightly different. And so prepositions uh, can actually do the same thing. And so you might see a preposition between a noun and its article. So for example, hoi apo ton uranon angeloi. And so you see here that hoi and angeloi agree with one another. That's the definite article and the noun. And in between, you have this prepositional phrase, apo ton uranon. And so that just means from heaven or from the heavens, uh, if you prefer. And so uh, a translation uh, in English would be uh, the angels who are from heaven. Um, and we're going to put the, that who are in parentheses there to indicate that for English, we sort of have to add it, but it's not really present in the Greek. So that's the first example. And the second example is when a preposition follows a noun and has its own article. So you see, ha anthropos, ha. And so that's the beginning of an attributive adjective phrase. And if we had ha anthropos, ha kalos, that would just mean the, the good or beautiful human being or, or person. And so instead we have ha anthropos, ha ento oiko. And so once again, we see this, this prepositional phrase is specifying which anthropos we're talking about. And so um, here we would translate this as the man who is in the house. All right, a few other um, notes from Croy's chapter. So first, um, there is elision, which is essentially the dropping of the final vowel of one word before another word that starts with a vowel. Okay, so again, the final vowel drops off when the next word begins with a vowel. The Greeks just didn't like to have vowels next to one another, and so you would have one drop off. Another similar uh, phenomenon in Greek is what is known as aspiration, and this is dropping the final vowel and changing the consonant before it, um, or before another word that starts with rough breathing. So it's it's essentially if you have a vowel at the end and you drop it, uh, but then the next word begins with a rough breathing, remember that sound, the hey sound, um, then that's going to affect how the consonant looks. It's going to be a different consonant. And finally, we've talked about this briefly in another lecture, but neuter plural subjects can take singular verbs. Unfortunately, 
none of this is done consistently. There are exceptions and sometimes aspiration happens and sometimes elision happens and sometimes they don't. So what? Well, again, you're, you're in the exception zone. The, the best thing that you can do is sort of recognize and kind of think through things rather than try to memorize all of these rules. All right, so let's get uh, started um, with this first practice and review exercise from Croy's textbook. So I wanna suggest a slightly modified strategy for more complex sentences. And so that is, I, I suggest that you find the simple sentence first. What do I mean by that? Well, I suggest that you bracket prepositional phrases. You can put, um, you know, just put some parentheses around them or, or do something else um, as you're working through them, but you want to bracket those prepositional phrases. Then, like in other exercises, you want to find that main verb. Then you want to find the nominative, which is, you know, the subject in most cases, and the accusative, which is, in many cases, the direct object. And then you want to go about translating the rest of the sentence. So in, in this case, let's look again at this Greek sentence. Pempomen tus adelphus tus kakus ektes ekklesias kai es ten eremon. So the first thing I suggested that we do is that we bracket the prepositional phrases and find the main verb. And so you can see I put some brackets around those prepositional phrases. Ektes ekklesias and es ten eremon. And I've underlined my main verb, pimplemen. And so um, here there is no um, nominative. It's implied by the verb, by that ending men. And so it's we send. And then I see that tus adelphus is in the accusative case. And so um, I know um, that, that that's our direct object, or as, at least I'm, I'm confident that that's our direct object. And so a, a very simple sentence would be, we sent the brothers, right? A, a subject, verb, and direct object. But now we need to translate the rest of the sentence, including that adjective, tus kakus. And so we would translate it fully as, we sent the bad brothers out of the church and into the desert. All right, so I want to do a little parsing again, just so you're clear uh, and have some examples of, of the sort of analysis that we'll be doing together in class. So first of all, we've already talked about pimplemen, and I would parse pimplemen as present active indicative, first person plural, and I know it's, it's this form because of the men ending. And so then I, we've talked about tus adelphus and tus kakus. We could uh, talk about that by extension. These are masculine plural accusative. And the endings, of course, us um, and kakus are consistent for the masculine plural um, accusative. So finally, let's talk about these words that follow the preposition. And so you'll see ek tes ecclesias. And you know that ek is the preposition that means out of or perhaps from in some cases. So ek takes uh, the, the genitive case for its preposition or for its subject or the subject of the preposition. And so we would parse tes ecclesias as feminine singular genitive. And if you were asked on a grammar quiz or on an exam why tes ecclesias is in the genitive case, you would simply say because it follows ek. And then let's look finally at ace ten eremon. All right, so ace is a preposition that means into. And if, if you've seen the vocabulary list, you remember that ace takes the accusative case. And fortunately, we see ten uh, is the feminine singular accusative of the definite article. And eremon here is an exception, one of those exceptions. It's a feminine noun that looks a whole lot like those masculine and neuter nouns of the second declension. And so we would parse eremon as feminine singular accusative. And if you were asked to say why it was accusative, you would explain that it's because it follows ace. Again, that's just a rule. The, the object of the preposition with ace is going to be in the accusative case. All right, so that is the end of this video lecture. And I know that we covered a good amount of ground here, particularly at the end of the lesson where I did some analysis of the sentence. And so as I've done in the past, I encourage you to 
uh, go back and rewatch this lecture, write down any questions that you have so that we can discuss those in person. Thank you very much for your attention.